I discovered the internet, or came to find out that it existed, in 1985, I believe it was. 80, no, perhaps 84. I mean, I actually got online in 85. Uh, and this was because I had been writing songs for a band in the United States called The Grateful Dead, and, and also because I was thinking about the future of community in America, because I came from a small uh, agricultural town that was a real community. I mean, when people even use the word now, they, they don't know what it means, I think, in many cases. But this was a place where everybody really literally counted on one another in a, in a life and death kind of way. And I thought, well, you know, this kind of place is going to go away uh, because it's, it's so heavily dependent on family ranching and farming. And I think that it offers kind of spiritual nutrition that people need. So what's going to replace this? And I was looking at the followers of the Grateful Dead who had a a community-like thing. I mean, it, it actually resembled some of the aspects of, of life in my little town, the way they counted on each other and the way they interacted randomly and, and knew each other. And I wanted to study them and see how they really operated in a more rigorously anthropological way. But the problem was that, that I was kind of a deal as far as they were concerned. Um, they had a... <laughs> somewhat misplaced, slightly religious view of, of who we in the band or the creative end of things were. And uh, so I'd come around them trying to find out what, what things were like with them and immediately alter the thing that I was looking at. And I had a friend uh, who was the founder of the commu computer music lab at Stanford who said, well, one way you could probably study the deadheads without them noticing would be to watch them on the internet. And I said, what do you mean watch them on the internet? And she said, well, there are news groups on the internet where they gather and you can, you can they're, and they're continuous. They're the, they're the sort of the village square that they, they use for continuous interaction. You were wondering where that was. Well, that's where it is. So I, I had a computer, which I was using mostly because uh, I was writing screenplays, and it was a much better form of whiteout. <laughs> you know, if you're going to rewrite a screenplay, you have to type the entire damn thing all over again. And also, I was doing, I was running a cattle ranch, and I had, you know, uh, some of the ranch accounting that I was doing on it. And, uh, and I got myself a 300 baud modem. Uh, which had a suction cup that fit on a telephone receiver and uh, didn't have anything that would, could easily be called an owner's manual. It just had a bunch of Hayes command terms that you were supposed to figure out how to enter with your computer. So it took me a while to get this thing to connect to the time net number that, that I'd been given to connect to the internet. And she'd given me an internet uh, uh, account at Stanford. And I got online and you know, struggled my way to the Grateful Dead news group. But in the process, I had this, I think, genuinely religious experience of feeling, sensing, seeing that what I was looking at, what, thin as it was, uh, just reduced to these little glowing characters on a screen was this infinitely expansive social space that every human being on the planet would be in at some point. We would all be there together simultaneously. Uh, and it resonated with me for another reason, because I had been a big fan in college of the works of a French theologian named Teilhard de Chardin, who uh, had written in the actually in the 30s, I believe, uh, and wasn't published until the 50s, uh, a set of theories. He was an he was evolutionary theorist and a paleontologist and a Jesuit uh, priest and a number of things. And, and he'd written this notion that evolution had this teleological thrust where things were getting more and more advanced and 
and uh, complex and, and sophisticated. Uh, which, you know, it, it seems somewhat evident. I mean, if you, if you compare us to single cell organisms. Uh, but his idea was that very shortly the evolutionary process would take leave of physical matter and become a thing that was evolving out of thought itself. And then we would have the next layer of evolution be something he called the noosphere, N-O-O. And that would be made out of thought and consciousness. And I had been very intrigued by that notion. It felt right to me. And when I saw the internet, I thought, ha, here we are. This is, this is the nervous system of the collective organism of mind already underway in its, in its uh, development. And I decided that almost immediately that this was something that I wanted to facilitate in any way that could be open to me because um, it just seemed like the great work that humanity was about to embark on or already had embarked on. And at that point, I don't suppose there were 200,000 people in the world with an email address. But it had already been going on for a while. I mean, it, the, inter the internet had been in existence since 1969. And this was 85, so, it, you know, it wasn't like a brand new thing, but it was, but it was, I would say it was new enough so that there were, I was the only cattle rancher on it. <laughs> you know, uh, it, just about everybody on it was coming from a completely different angle, which enabled me to perceive things about it that I think were a little harder for some of the folks that were using it at that point to see. Uh, since a lot of them were still just trying to get a packet to go from A to B and, and trying to figure out why it wouldn't a lot of the time. And, dealing with the technical issues and, and not fully perceiving uh, just how huge this was. Uh, I mean, I felt then and I continue to feel and have taken a certain measure of crap for saying that, that this is the most important technological event in the history of humanity since the capture of fire. And, and you could really say that it's been going on for longer than people think it has. I mean, I, I would mark the beginning of this whatever we call this, the internet, to be that point, and I think it was uh, 1837 when Samuel F. B. Morris tapped out what hath God wrought in Washington, D.C., and someone read it simultaneously in Baltimore. As soon as you could communicate instantaneously at a distance like that, then everything changed, and, and changes more and more all the time. Uh, but that was, that was what got me interested in it to begin with. And, and, you know, I didn't, for a long time, I didn't know what it was that I was going to be able to do that would be useful outside of learn everything I possibly could about it, how it worked and uh, what was going on on it and, and that kind of thing. Um, but I, I did depart the cattle business at, at, in 1988 and was looking around for what I wanted to do next. And I thought that the most important thing that I could do would be to start thinking and writing about the internet in terms of the social and political and economic and philosophical and even religious aspects of what, what this might do in the world. Because I could, I could easily imagine it changing everything. I mean, I could easily imagine it causing there to be a fundamental renegotiation of all the existing power re relationships on the planet in a relatively short time. And nobody seemed to be writing or talking about that. And so even though I didn't, you know, I didn't have any credentials to speak of, uh, I thought, well, I, I can probably know as much about this as the next guy pretty quickly. And I got to know the people who had been working on it. Spent a lot of time around them, uh, really, really appreciating how blessed we had been with the, with the quality of, of those people who, who actually were very aware, in many cases, of what it was that they were doing. Uh, and maybe they, didn't, they weren't writing about it necessarily, uh, but they were certainly thinking about it. <laughs> 
Uh, and, and then um, in late 89, by that time I'd, I'd gotten onto something called the well, which wasn't connected to the internet, it was a bulletin board. Uh, and it had been started by uh, Stuart Brand and Kevin Kelly. Stuart Brand had, had written the whole, had done the Whole Earth Catalog, and had Whole Earth Review Magazine, and uh, uh, Kevin Kelly eventually became the editor of Wired. Uh, but they had uh, they'd put together a computer bulletin board that was really. The, the digital salon of its time. I mean, there were, there were a lot of extremely articulate, thoughtful, uh, uh, literary people on the well. And uh, there was a continuous set of discussions going on there that was very fruitful to be part of. And Harper's Magazine, and I, you know, to this day, I, I don't know what inspired those guys to do this, but there were a couple of editors at Harper's, one of them named uh, Paul Tuff, and the other one named Jack Hitt, and <laughs> completely mis misnamed people. I mean, <laughs> not at all violent. But they had this idea that they wanted to do a Harper's Forum on um, a bunch of items that are very pertinent, particularly at the moment, uh, about what is forbidden knowledge, what is a secret, what is, uh, what is hacking, what is, when is it? When is it wrong? Uh, you know, how do we how do we define barriers for information in digital environments? Uh, you know, a whole bunch of these kinds of issues. And they want they asked me and and several other people to to be a part of this forum on the well. And there were these kids that uh, they, they were phone freaks or uh, early phone system hackers. What they, what they really were doing was breaking into the telephone system and trying to create their own internet because they didn't have access to the real thing. They were all like 14 years old. And uh, they had these fearsome names like uh, fiber optic, that P-H-I-B-E-R-O-P-T-I-K, and acid freak, and scorpion. And they had an organization called the Legion of Doom. And <laughs> You know, and they they spend an awful lot of time strutting around like they were pretty dangerous, and they were irritating, especially to an old hippie. Uh, and at one point, I I made some slightly insulting remark about how if somebody took away their modems and gave them skateboards, it wouldn't make a damn bit of difference. <laughs> and this being true, it really irritated them. So uh, they downloaded my entire credit record file into the into the conference and said that they could change it at will if they felt like it, which they couldn't. They were bragging. But the, the fact remained, it, it scared me. Because you know, if you don't have any credit in America, you, you might as well be broke. And um, so, so I said, look, you know, I think we've just exceeded the bandwidth of this medium. Uh, I would appreciate it if you'd give me a call. And I won't insult your intelligence by giving you my phone number. Which was listed anyway, but they didn't know that. And uh, immediately, I get this phone call from like six different kids on different phone booths in in New York. And they've all parachuted in through through the phone system, and and their voices haven't even changed yet. I mean, they're just kids. And I'm thinking, wow, well, I know where these kids are at. I mean, they're they're like I was when I was that age. You know, they just want to violate the forbidden. And the forbidden they really want to violate, you know, is the usual one that teenage boys want to violate. But they, they haven't come up with access to that yet. So they're doing stuff to the phone system. And uh, so I got to know them pretty well. I, I just had a, an affinity for them. I mean, the next thing I knew, I was kind of like the scout master to the Legion of Doom. <laughs> and, uh, and then one day, um, one of them comes home and finds that his 12-year-old sister has been held at gunpoint for quite a while by several large men from the Secret Service while they remove every single electronic item from his house, like his clock radio and his Metallica tapes. I mean, they're just taking it all. Uh, <laughs> and, I'm, and, and then I find that several of others of them have had the same, roughly the same experience. 
And I'm thinking, well, maybe these kids are much worse than I thought. I mean, this sounds like they must be doing something pretty bad or they wouldn't be getting such acute government action all over them. And it was about that time that I got a phone call from uh, Special Agent Richard Baxter from the Rock Springs, Wyoming field office of the FBI, uh, who was a fellow that I knew because he, was, he investigated livestock theft and I'd had some cattle stolen at one point. He was pretty good on that stuff. And he was nervous as a cat in a room full of rocking chairs. He, he was just anxious and I, I uh, he said he wanted to come up and talk to me, but he couldn't tell me what it was, what it was about on the phone. And I thought, oh God, I mean, I'm writing songs for the Grateful Dead. I don't want to have a visit from the FBI where he won't tell me what it's about, right? <laughs> you know, it just, it, it's a, it makes you uneasy. So he comes up and he's very nervous and, and uh, he has a terrible time explaining to me what it is that he's investigating because he doesn't understand it very well himself. But I gradually I understand that somebody has taken some of the source code from one of the ROM, from the ROM chip on the Macintosh, all that source code that, that, that dealt with the early version of QuickTime, and has sent various uh, bits of it out on floppy disks to people uh, in a protest against Apple's closed architecture. Um, and has threatened to release the entire body of the source code. And Apple has freaked out and has told the FBI that somebody's about to go out there giving away the, the precious Macintosh recipe. And in no time at all, they'll be making them in Taiwan and that'll be the end of it. All of which is just nonsense, right? But he's convinced that you know there's a major economic crime about to take place being perpetrated by something that he keeps calling the New Prosthesis League. Its actual name was the New Prometheus League. But I mean, that was just part of what he had wrong. He had everything wrong. And it was a really disturbing experience. I mean, you never like to see really insecure, highly, highly armed uh, people in authority wandering around in places they don't understand, because trouble will come. And I, and I felt you know, that what I was seeing was the same thing that my friends from the Legion of Doom had been seeing. And, I, and I'd, I'd also, in the meantime, I'd heard about some other stuff like this going on. There'd been a, a role-playing game company in uh, uh, Austin, Texas, that had had these Secret Service come in and just take everything in their office because they were doing a, a game called Cypherpunk that the, that the Secret Service had decided was a handbook for computer crime. And, uh, and there, were, there was a kid in, in Indiana, who'd, uh, or Illinois, I guess it was, who was publishing an online magazine called Frack, where he'd published a, a stolen document from the phone company about the 911 system. You know, I mean, you could buy this, this document from Belcor for 12 bucks, but you know, this was just sort of a trophy that he'd put up as being something that he'd, that he'd hacked out of the system. And he was being charged with uh, the theft of $200,000 in property. And uh, so it was like that, you know. And I wrote something about this, which I put on the well, called Crime and Puzzlement, about the whole experience. And two days later, I got a phone call from Mitch Kapor, who had uh, created Lotus 123. At that time, it was the dominant spreadsheet software and it was kind of, Lotus as a company was kind of like Microsoft. I mean, for microcomputers, it was a very big deal. And he was flying his private jet over the United States and he had also had a visit from the FBI that he hadn't told anybody about. And he'd read my piece and uh, so suddenly he had a support network, kind of. And um, he wanted to, he wanted to just basically drop out of the sky and come talk to me about this, which he did. And we spent the afternoon, and I told him everything I knew about Steve Jackson games and the Legion of Doom, et cetera. And, and we decided that what we would do was get some civil liberties firm involved, uh, since he could afford that, and 
reestablish the Constitution in uh, what I had started calling cyberspace in that initial piece. I mean, uh, up to that point, it didn't have a name. I st and I just borrowed Bill Gibson's name for it and started referring to it as that. I think that's the first time anybody started talking about this as that. Uh, and um, so we, we brought suit in several cases. We started to get some publicity. Uh, and there, there were suddenly a lot of people that wanted to get involved. Uh, Steve Wozniak came forward and gave us 100 grand. John Gilmore, who is still very much an integral part of, of EFF, came forward. He, he sent me an email. He, he, I, I didn't know him very well. He sent me an email. He said, well, I, I don't have the kind of money that Mitch has, but would $100,000 help? That was all it said. I said, yes. So, <laughs> uh, but, you know, we hadn't been at this very long before we started to realize that we were this was not just going to be a simple matter of clarifying the application of the First Amendment to bits or the Fourth Amendment to computer files. Uh, and in fact, at one point after we'd made a little publicity, I got an email from some kid who had crawled across the border into Finland from what was still the Soviet Union in order to send me an email saying, well, that's all great, but what about us? We don't even have a, a we don't even have a First Amendment or a Fourth Amendment, uh, and and I realized that, you know, it was another one of those sort of come to Jesus moments where I, I realized that in cyberspace nobody had a First Amendment really, and never would because the thing is all rights are derived naturally from the ability to deny rights. All rights are the flip side of coercive. And you know, if you've got an environment where it's very difficult to, to impose yourself on human beings, which it is there, I mean, for all of their efforts to make it so, it's very difficult to convey the, the opposite of that imposition as well. And so we knew that what we could do for a while was to use the law, especially in places like the United States where there was one that we could apply. But ultimately, it was the real, the real thing was going to have to be influencing the, the architecture of the internet as it, as it grew, so that it went on having those interesting characteristics of, of leaderlessness and practical anarchy that it had had since it was born. Uh, and that would convey, to some extent, a, a lot of those rights. And we also were very aware that the internet was probably going to grow into something that would be like the most sophisticated tool for surveillance that human beings had ever derived. And we're now seeing just how true that is. But we, but we had this faith that if, if the architecture were preserved in its open state, that it was conceivable to us that the internet would eventually be something where anybody, anywhere, could say whatever they wanted and nobody would be in a position to stop them. And that anybody, anywhere, could learn as much as could then be known about anything that people studied. And that that, you know, from the, from the standpoint of Tyard de Chardin's uh, global organism of mind would be a pretty significant human development. Uh, and so that's what, what EFF has done, what I have done in, in the 20 some odd years since that is to be continuously at work on keeping choke points from forming around the internet. Uh, keeping legal controls from being imposed, uh, minding the architecture a lot. I mean, I've spent a huge amount of time. Uh, I realized in about 1993 that the most, the most likely way in which, you were, in which the powers that had been would be able to control information on the internet 
was going to be through intellectual property law. Uh, that you know, the claim that one could own speech uh, would be the means by which uh, people would be able to stop its flow because they would say, that, no, that's my speech, that can't flow, uh, or expression of whatever sort it might be. So I wrote a piece called uh, The Economy of Ideas for Wired in 93, and that was, you know, I will immodestly say that I think that was, that was one of the most important things anybody said at that point about, about in the internet because nobody was thinking about it in those terms. Nobody realized yet that there was, that it, it, if you had an environment where you could re reproduce anything that a human being could, could create with his mind, infinitely at zero cost and distribute it infinitely at zero cost, uh, the whole notion of copyright was just out the window. And besides, copyright existed in the first place to protect this manufacturing process that had to be there in order to spread ideas, since you didn't have another way to do it besides embedding them in a physical object which was manufactured and had to be, and that cost money, and you had to ship the thing around, and that cost money. And so you needed something to protect the people that were making those objects. But suddenly you didn't. And, that, and the people who'd been making those objects thought that what they were really selling was the, was the wine and not the bottles. They were really in the bottling business. They didn't know anything about the wine business. And they were going to get very aggressive about trying to maintain their business model as it became completely irrelevant, which it has. And so that's been a big part of what we've done. I mean, at the time that I wrote that, I think I might have been one of four people on planet Earth that thought this was a problem. And, you know, now I would say I've got entire armies of people who agree with me on this. Mm -hmm. You know. Uh, what else? I mean, I, I uh, at a certain point, popped off and, and wrote, a document called the, the, the Declaration of the Independence of Cyberspace, which I really did not intend to become some canonical document. I mean, I was, I, I'd been to the World Economic Forum and I'd seen all this sort of strutting around in the twilight of the nation state. Uh, and the, the United States government had just signed into law something called the Communications Decency Act, which, which made it a felony to say fuck online. And, and given the fact that I'd heard many of those words that were now felonious to speak in digital media in the Senate dining room, I knew this wasn't going to go very well. Uh, and so I, I dashed this thing off in the middle of a party, really, uh, and sent it out to my friends, and it, and it became, I don't know, I think you can probably find it on several hundred thousand websites. <laughs> And people now pay more attention there. And it, go, it goes through periods of being laughed at and then taken seriously. You know, there was a time there where people really thought, well, governments really are going to, you know, they're going to they're gonna win this thing. They're going to really take over. But I, I still have no strong reason to believe that, that sovereignty in the, in the sense that the, the nation state thinks of it is going to ever be successfully imposed on cyberspace. And, and in fact, I would say that you know, more and more people are waking up to the fact that the nation state doesn't have a terribly good reason to go on existing, because the main thing that it does is, is make war. Well, I mean, there were, I think there were you know, quite a number of moments. Uh, you know, there was, uh, there was the time that, that uh, EFF was trying to deal with the fact that they were trying to basically, well, they, they had succeeded essentially in outlawing strong cryptography uh, by making cryptographic algorithms the equivalent of machine guns as far as the international trade in arms was concerned. So you couldn't, you couldn't export a strong crypto, uh, piece of strong crypto software or hardware that contained strong crypto, which essentially meant that there was no no business for the, the people that would actually be creating such stuff. 
And uh, we had this really incredibly clever insight that, that an encryption algorithm was a form of speech. And what they were essentially doing was, was imposing prior restraint on speech, and that was, that was unconstitutional. They couldn't do that. And we managed to get something called the Bernstein decision. And that stopped the, the uh, control of strong crypto, which I think was extremely important because if it hadn't been for that, you wouldn't have any business going on on the net. It would be impossible to, to do all the economic stuff that is routinely done if you couldn't have encrypted things as the, as the NSA and the FBI wanted it to be, since they were much more worried about controlling terrorism and child pornography than they were about creating the future. And that's always the case. Uh, you know, I would say, I mean, there have been some moments lately, you know, doing, that's, well, setting up, setting up an organization, which I recently did with Daniel Ellsberg and John Cusack and several others, to, uh, to see to the funding of WikiLeaks and to working out ways of keeping Mr. Snowden out of harm's way, uh, which I think has been, and, and, and also encouraging him and others like him to come forward. I mean, uh, setting this thing up as being something that would be protective for people like that. So when he, when he decided to come forward, he, he contacted two people from this organization that is only seven or eight months old, the Freedom of the Press Foundation, and got Glenn Greenwald and Laura Poitras to come and and uh, take his statement. So, I mean, that's a more recent thing. It's sort of tied into the first thing. Oh, gosh, what else? I mean, I, uh, Dave Farber, who you're probably also talking to, and I were instrumental in getting China on the Internet, which was kind of a big moment. Uh, the, the Chinese Academy of Scientists, Sciences had us come to uh, Beijing in 93 to talk about the Internet. Uh, along with Mitch Kapoor, and uh, we thought that was interesting. I mean, we didn't know that they knew anything about it, really. But there were five major research universities in China that were using TCP/IP as their as their their uh, uh, internet networking protocol, and uh, so we talked about how it was here, and we gave a kind of an academic talk. We didn't feel like China was likely to be very interested in getting connected to it. Um, and then there was a dinner afterwards where I was, I was seated with this extraordinary woman named Madam Hu, uh, <laughs> who's on first, uh, and she was the vice chair of the Academy of Sciences and the person who was in charge of the, uh, of the Chinese computer networks and is still uh, the Chinese representative in the Internet Society to this day. And uh, she... Uh, I, I, we, we were having all these toasts, and it was getting harder and harder to think. And I said, before we have another toast, Madam Hua, uh, I want to talk to you about the Internet. And she said, that's good. That's why you're here. And I said, well, I'll just cut to the chase. I want China to be connected to the Internet. And she said, that's good. That's why you're here. And I said, well, China wants to be connected to the Internet? She said, of course we do. And I said, well, why aren't you then? And she said, because your Department of Energy has the idea that if we get connected to the Internet, we'll steal all your nuclear secrets. And I said, well, I would have thought 10,000 grad students could do a perfectly fine job of that. And she said, of course they could. And besides, you don't have that many. You know, nuclear weapons are mostly about having the industrial capacity to make that much weapons grade uranium. Uh, and I said, well, all right. Uh, Surely there are some people in your government that, this was not that long after Tiananmen Square, I said, surely there are some people in your government that would uh, be a little uncomfortable about uh, having every, every student in China have a global printing press. And she said, of course there are, but they wouldn't know that that was what this is. And I'd, I've always felt it's better to apologize than ask permission. <laughs> So we went back and talked to the National Science Foundation and the Department of Energy and, and backed them down and got China connected. 
Oh, I would say that it is as it almost always is uh, with a huge thunderhead taking up half the sky on one side and a glorious blue sky on the other and, and difficult to figure out which direction the wind's moving. But, you know, the, the interesting thing about the internet, and I've been fighting these battles all along between the, the, the powers of the past and the powers of the future, and this really is the entire industrial period and even, you know, you could even say the entire period of monotheism itself up against the future. Uh, but it, so far, it's been what I would call a, a stalemate. You know, you got more and more and more and more people involved, bigger and bigger and bigger f forces engaged. But so far, I'd say we've been beating them pretty much to a draw, uh, which will suffice. You know, and, and eventually, I would say that we can take some heart in the idea that, that most of the people who feel the way I do about this are young. And most of the people who feel the way that they do about this are old. You know, and someday, all, you know, you guys will be alive when they're dead. And, uh, you know, and then I think the, the future can truly get underway. Well, they, they haven't changed all that much. I mean, my greatest hope and the thing I've been working for most of my life now is that it will, it will realize itself as being something that makes it possible for anybody to know anything that they're capable of knowing, uh, which I think is a, a wonderful thought, or, or that, that will make it possible for anybody that has something important that other people should hear to say it. Uh, without without any fear of being shut up or coerced or or that sort of thing, and my fear I think is probably you know deeply connected with all of the the things that I hope for in the sense that you know human beings are are flawed creatures, and a lot of what we want to say is really kind of awful, and you know we. We have economic ambitions that, that are finding all kinds of ugly new ways to manifest themselves, and I think that's a pity. And, and it certainly becomes possible to, uh, to see practically everything in, in people's lives. You know, you're, you're reeling out this digital slime trail all the time now that can be rolled up, you know, turned into you. And there's almost no help for that. Ultimately, now I don't mind that, but because I come from a small town where everybody knew everything about me anyway. But I, you know, what's got to happen in order for this to be a safe state is that the is that the institutions have to become as transparent as the individuals. Uh, we can't go on having greater and greater secrecy in our institutions and less and less privacy as, as people. And so, that's I think the the biggest question of the moment right now. And if we don't win that one, uh, I, I can imagine a very grim future. I think we will. I mean, you know, the, 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 we are down to look at what's going on with Bradley Manning and, 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 and Julian Assange and Edward Snowden. I mean, that's the tip of the iceberg. There's going to be a lot more of that. Because, you know, the governments and the, and the great powers of the industrial period have done a lot of crummy stuff that is at minimum embarrassing. And they don't want, they don't want people to know about this. And, and suddenly it's going to be very difficult to keep people from knowing about this unless they just go out and, you know, torture to death everybody who does something about it. You know? Yeah. So it's going to be pretty rough on the people that are trying to change it for a while. What needs to happen now is that everybody who knows anything that ought to be known by the rest of humanity should reveal it. As, as, as hard as that will be. What needs to happen now is that everybody should realize that we have, as a human right, the right to know about everything that is humanly applicable in any larger sense.
about our government, about science, about anything. That this is, this is something that has never been promulgated before because it was never before possible, but it is now possible. And it's, it's a right that we need to develop and assert. That's, that's the most important thing for us to be doing, I think. Well, you know, I, I, I fully expect that it's going to go on being basically the same contest for quite a while. Like, you know, it's been the same contest as long as I've been engaged in it, and it will go on being that contest. You know, and maybe that's just the human contest. It's, you know, the, the, the control freaks versus the anarchists or the Apollonians versus the Dionysians. Uh, it's people who love liberty versus people who fear it. And it may just be actually love versus fear in the final analysis. So there will always be that sort of thing. It's a very powerful thing, the internet. You know, and it, it's certainly capable of, of, of doing a lot of harm and good at the same time. I mean, I, I like to say that you know, I've been I've been dealing with the internet now long enough so that it has actually realized all of my dreams and, and with them my worst nightmares. <laughs>